Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, UCL information session on addressing global challenges through the interdisciplinary social sciences. And this is a joint event co-organized by three um, programs or departments um, at UCL. Um, we come from, uh, for example, UCL Institute for Global Prosperity, represented by me, um, UCL Geography Department, represented by Pushpa, and the UCL Gender and Sexuality Studies, uh, represented by Docs Alex Hyde. So um, as you can see, this is, as we are trying to show you here, this is interdisciplinary collaboration across different departments. And I think that also reflects the nature of this session where we try to attract the students from different disciplines and try to explain to you what are the transdisciplinary uh, approaches and programs that we have at UCL. Just to remind you that the session today will be recorded. And we have also opened up the Q&A box. So if you have any questions uh, during this whole session, please post questions using the Q&A function. And then we will answer your questions at the very end of today's event. So the event is organized in two parts. In the first part, each of us uh, coming from the three programs will provide a taste lecture and each lecture will last for five or six minutes to give you a bit of a general idea of what is being taught if you are enrolled in one of these master's programs. And afterwards, we will also provide, in the second part of it, we will provide a very brief introduction to the master programs that we are uh, currently recruiting that we want to introduce to you. So feel free to use um, the chat box because some of the sessions by me be more interactive than others. Um, now, just to test this function, please, you can feel free to uh, type in the chat box uh, wherever you are currently based so that you, we know um, uh, which part of the world we are interacting with. And uh, uh, if you have any specific questions, I think it's preferably you can use the Q&A function because it's easier for us to manage it. Thank you, Lauren, coming from London, very close to us. Um, any other people who want to share where you are? From India, great. Well, we are, we are seeing a very um, wide geographic ranges. Um, as you type, I think because we have a very tight session and we want to make the best use of time, I think let's just start with the session today. Yeah. So first of all, uh, a bit of introduction about myself. I'm uh, Yuan um, or uh, Dr. Yuan. He did doctor is my academic title, but you can call me Yuan. And uh, I'm the module leader. Uh, program leader of the Global Pros Prosperity Master's Program, as you can see here. Um, today's taste lecture is a bit of an introduction about what is prosperity, because that's the, that's the question that we got asked the most. When, when, whenever we try to introduce our programs to students, they always ask, well, what is global prosperity? I've never heard of it. So uh, we position ourselves as a post-development program. We say so because um, I myself was trained in development studies at Cambridge University um, from um, uh, both MPhil and PhD degrees. And my specific focus of research is on comparative studies between India and China, specifically relating to the develop relationship between development and the democracy. Basically, whether democracy, for example, whether democracy work can work for um, large developing countries like China and India, where a lot of people are probably not as educated as in the Western liberal democracies, but can democracy work in such social contexts? So that is the personal intellectual question that I have. And in recent years, my own research is more focused on how women are actually leading the democratic transformative changes and also development in the Eastern, in the Eastern and also uh, South Asian context. So uh, why do we need a post-development theory or what is this theory about? So in today's lecture of five minutes, 
I know that we're not possible to cover everything. That is why I chose five different books that I think can give you a brief idea of the transition from GDP focused kind of idea of understanding of economic development to development studies and to why we need a transition towards post development. So as you can see here, the first book is about a brief introduction of history, basically history of GDP. So GDP as a national account for students who understand economics was first well, first introduced or used by William Petty back in the uh, 1691 to calculate like how much wealth the British um, Empire has back then. And further on, it was, I think, populated during the colonial period when a lot of these Western imperialist countries tried to understand how, what kind of, whether their business is successful or not by having all these colonies abroad. That is why the, the colonial history related to the GDP. And then when it comes to after the post-colonial period, um, nation states started to establish in the developing countries, um, people start to question uh, for, for that period of time. So GDP is the sole um, measurement of economics. So how well the economics is going is usually measured by the GDP. And there is a clear focus on growth. So the more GDP, the better or the better advanced the economy is. But the problem is that by the 1960s, as you can see here, this book called Growth Without Development, scholars start to question the inequality that is happening, which is not captured by GDP, because you can have a country who has a lot of wealth, but it's not equally distributed among the population. And therefore, a lot of people are not developed in the process. And at the same time, start, scholars also start to aware of the kind of detrimental effect on uh, GDP growth to the ecology, or to the growth, to the environment. And this book called The Limits to Growth is usually considered as the foundational book for ecological economics. And as time goes by, feminist scholars, also fem especially feminist economists, also try to argue that actually the whole GDP calculation, the market-based economic system, actually focus too much on the productive, productive activities that is happening around the sphere of the market while ignoring all the reproductive activities that women are doing for free for centuries in the reproductive sphere. So that gender becomes a relevant a point when we think about what is actually development and for what. And that is where um, Nobel economics laureate, Professor Amatya Sen, who originally um, come from India, become the master of Trinity College at Cambridge. And that is also where I met him because he came here time to time to deliver lectures and also moved to Harvard and becomes a professor there. So he's trying to bring the philosophical economic philosophy back to the thinking of development. And he's trying to argue that the development in the end is to enlarge the freedom for everybody, to cultivate the capabilities for different people that we are trying to develop. So this is a brief history from development to GDP to development. But why do we need post-development? Because a lot of the time when we think about development, it usually it is a top-down approach. It's like a planning governed by the people from the top who, who are dictating what kind of development trajectories we need. So in post-development, we try to challenge this constant emphasis on wealth accumulation, um, the top-down approach, we try to bring in more bottom-up approaches to the understanding of development by asking people, what kind of development do you want by giving the voice back to the people and the, to organize democratic ways in organizing how the economy, in deciding how the economy should be run or how the society could be um, organized. And we also try to incorporate all the criticism against development that has been um, going around for decades, including inequality, ecology, gender, uh, into, the latest into the latest discussion. And that is why the latest scholar trend is to shift from the very original GDP-focused conception to a more diversified development and to post-development, where we allow the people who are supposed to be developed to have a voice in deciding what kind of society that they want to live in. So this is a very brief taste lecture for me. And I think um, let's welcome um, Pushpa to introduce um, uh, her taste lecture. Okay, great. Thanks for that, um, Yuan. Um, 
actually in geography department we do have an undergraduate geography curriculum where we cover development geography in great detail so this um um, this uh, op open event is actually quite a reminder of how many of these themes and concerns cut across different departments, which is the richness of the pedagogic curriculum we offer at UCL as well. So as a good example, um, here I am, I'm Pushpa Rabindu. I have an interdisciplinary training because I studied architecture in India. I did master's in urban design um, in the US. I came to um, LSE, London School of Economics uh, in the UK to do my PhD in urban planning, which was situated in the Department of Geography. And that was my first entry point into the social sciences um, uh, curriculum. And since then, I have uh, been based in the Department of Geography here at UCL when we launched the MSc Urban Studies program in 2008 as an interdisciplinary MSc that cuts across geography, Bartlett, um, uh, our anthropology, archaeology, um, and several other uh, faculties, um, including even engineering. So the MSc Urban Studies curriculum is um, uh, truly interdisciplinary in the sense that uh, while we have a, a, a diet of what are essentials, we allow students to tailor the uh, program as per their uh, individual interests. But a lot of our uh, engagement is around this broad discourse of what is known as urban studies, um, which, uh, which emerges from a critical discussions within geography, but it cuts across into uh, engagements with architecture, planning, design, as well as sociological um, uh, questions around um, around the city and what is the urban. So for this taste of lecture, since a lot of our um, uh, mod uh, modules are quite interactive and seminar based, um, I thought I will get all of you to think of a public space, which is roughly 500 meters from where you are currently located. Um, and so in the chat column, could you um, type in if you are close to a public space, uh, 500 meters is to kind of um, indicate a public space that is at walking distance to you. So uh, I'm based in London near Elephant and Castle where I'm next to a huge park, which is Burgess Park, um, uh, which is about a 60 hectare um, green space. And I'm typing that. Um, and I'd like all of you to type in what you consider as a public space, which is next to you. And it doesn't have to be a, um, a green space. Uh, it, I, I want to know what is it in your mind that is a public space? So can you just take quickly like 30 seconds to type in, um, including Yuan and Alex, if you think you're next to a public space. Uh, it can be just as a cue. It can be a library. It can be a community center, childcare. It can be a playground, um, anything. So uh, let's see, um, nothing's coming on at the moment. Um, Library, okay, great. A public footpath, okay. Um, that's bringing the expectations a bit low. <laughs> Playground at a pet ground, university campus plaza. That makes sense if you're based at a university. Public footpath, again. Uh, um, Hammersmith Metro. Transport is a public space. We often don't think about transport as a public space. Um, um, campus, Primrose Hill, children's primary school and playground, um, Kew Gardens, private entry but public space for the people, um, Elephant Park. Okay, somebody's near me, Elephant Park and Castle Square. Great to see you. Supermarket, okay, um, that's interesting in, in terms of how we think about shopping and retail. That's something we often forget um, as, a, as a space that is retail can be public space and the evolution of shopping malls as public spaces is very closely tied with the way we think about shopping as a public activity. So that's quite interesting. Um, so that one of the things that we try to do um, in uh, in this module, in one of the core uh, mod, uh, in this program, and one of the core modules that we offer through City Space and Power, is to really think in terms of um, you know how some of the critical debates are framed by contestations and conflicts, but it also reveals uh, positionality and power. So, you know, how these co contestations and conflicts get resolved. How is it, uh, what is a, po a politics of consensus that emerges in negotiations that we often might have uh, in terms of access uh, to these um, public spaces? 
So the first thing is, how would you describe it? What makes it public? And so like some of you have said, you know, um, like for instance, Kew Gardens, it's private entry, but public spaces. So in London, uh, you have a trend that is known as uh, POPs, pub privately owned public spaces. Um, the most uh, popular example of POPs I can think of is King's Cross development, where a lot of the new developments in and around King's Cross in terms of open spaces like the Granary Square is a super animated, interesting um, space, um, aesthetically very pleasing to the public eye and you can access it, but it's heavily controlled in terms of surveillance, okay? So there is subtle um, um, uh, regulatory mechanisms that, are, that go behind the um, uh, scene in terms of how these pseudo public spaces are managed. And that's something that we tend to encourage students to peel back and engage with and explore, um, you know, and what we also um, encourage students is to step away from some of these very popular um, uh, public spaces that might be in the news for kind of the big conflicts or contestations, particularly around uh, marches or around axes, and think in terms of local neighborhood spaces as well. So we've had students who have done dissertations around traffic islands, and um, through the uh, neighborhood forums around traffic islands, they reveal different kinds of partnerships that might, um, uh, that might emerge in terms of uh, how planning knowledges or urban studies discourses might be used um, to, um, to suggest how social relationships are built uh, and using those social relationships to think about um, the way governance uh, can be um, as a, can emerge as a um, as a way of asserting uh, control in a city. So what we have done, we we do through this program is to also encourage the way in which public space public spaces can be explored as social infrastructure, how it reveals challenges when it comes to claiming right to the city. So right to the city is a very um, uh, well established. Um, um, uh, 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 social science lens from uh, Henry Lefebvre, the French sociologist. And it's some of these uh, sociological li literature that we uh, develop in thinking critically about uh, uh, prominent urban challenges, such as uh, what makes a public space uh, uh, public and what is it in terms of access to all, um, which students get an opportunity to uh, explore all through the year. I'll stop there. Thank you, Pushpa. Um, next, let's welcome Alex to introduce, give a TED lecture about gender studies. Thank you both. Uh, it's great to be here and also just to see the connections and diversity that we represent around these really fascinating um, areas of study. I'm going to zoom everyone into uh, week four of term one on uh, Masters in Gender, Society and Representation. And I will go through elements of the programme a little bit later and tell you more about us. But for now, you have to imagine that you're here, you're, you've chosen to study this multidisciplinary uh, MA. And we're taking you on a whirlwind tour of some of the um, issues in contemporary and historical gender politics uh, in a range of different contexts. So in week four of term one, we do a session on our core course called Rights, Agency and Empowerment in a Global Context. And you can see here a few of the example readings that we uh, ask students to look at. And we also on this week ask for students' responses to two videos. Uh, the Girl Effect, Hear Her Voice video, which was made during the pandemic to represent women's uh, young women's experiences of lockdown. And the uh, photographer artist Zanele Maholi, who is from South Africa, uh, their work on portraits of LGBTQ plus um, people living their everyday lives in often urban contexts in South Africa. Next slide, please, Sonia. And really the framing for this whole session is uh, sitting with some elements of paradox and discomfort and the tensions in how uh, feminist and gender scholars and activists have conventionally thought of uh, rights and how to mobilize around questions of rights for social change. And I think uh, I usually start by looking at uh, Hillary Clinton's famous address um, to the Beijing conference um, 
around women's rights as human rights. And I look at Wendy Brown's scholarships, um, exploring how difficult it is to call women together under one singular banner of uh, women's rights and the question of how then that idea of women's rights and the specificity of women's oppression um, fits into or sits outside of the notion of human rights. Um, so we're asking questions around whether or not we can uh, somehow hold the specificity of women's concerns in relation to this universal call of human rights that are um, attendant to every single person on the planet. We are looking at the sort of strategic discourse of trying to make a claim for women's rights as somehow on a par with or taking up as much space within that category of human and the universal category that that kind of that that is. And we are kind of questioning about this sort of discomfort between um, what really comes up again and again in our initial uh, core course, um, this tension between different models for thinking of uh, women's empowerment, but also LGBTQ plus rights around uh, seeking representation on terms of equality or difference. So we can either have a model where we seek to have equality with, for example, men, a claim around women's specific uh, capacities being the same as, or we are seeking to uh, mobilise on terms of the specificity of women's differences from men, for example. Um, so, we, so these are concerns that historically go back to uh, Wollstonecraft in a UK context, to Virginia Woolf's writing, to um, de Beauvoir's ideas about women and gender and rights and uh, the, the act of becoming woman. So we start looking at some of the kind of theoretical uh, bases for these thoughts. Um, next slide, please, Sonia. And then we move on in this session to uh, the question of sort of historicizing these rights relations, really, going from uh, the woman question, as it might be termed in suffrage movements around the world, to ideas about queer questions. And this is where we get into some of the critical theory from queer scholarship that is really um, a queer and post-colonial critique of discourses around time. And again, coming back also to the to Yuan's ideas about development and the chrononormativity, how actually we can see that uh, time becomes an apparatus of regulation and we the, from the global north positing the perspective of sort of mandatory futurity and development towards uh, this future goal on the part of um, other nations outside of the global north. So, for example, the idea that once a, that a country's woman question is addressed and, you know, equal rights are without question achieved on that front, which is debatable still. Then we move on to the question of LGBTQ plus rights as another symbol or signal of a country's modernity and progressiveness. And uh, in this article by Raoul Rao, a uh, queer scholar um, using post-colonial uh, analysis, he also points to Hillary Clinton's speech 10 years later on International Human Rights Day, Human rights Day um, where she moved from talking about women's rights as human rights to gay rights as human rights. And last slide, please, Sonia. And here is just a sample to finish of some student blog contributions we had from this um, particular session where I asked students to respond to the two videos from Zanelli Mahole and the Hear Her Voice video. And really some of the lovely uh, critical perspectives that come from encouraging students to engage with uh, video materials, but also to kind of use some of those initial theoretical formations to formulate their own response to um, a really broad range of materials. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Very effective use of six minutes. And I would encourage students who have listened to these lectures to position yourself while, um, and asking yourself, would this be an interest, would this be a topic 
or master's program or session that is of interest to me. So in the next part, each of us will also give a very brief introduction about the master's programs that we are offering. And uh, you, as I said, any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, drop them in the Q&A section and we will ask them and we'll answer all of them um, at the end. So um, as you can see from my background, we are celebrating the 10th year of the Institute for Global Prosperity. And uh, uh, here is a picture of our founder, uh, Professor uh, Henrietta Moore, and I introduce her specifically uh, because I think the operation of the IGP uh, really has a lot to do with her kind of background or the kind of vision for the new education that she is trying to bring to the higher education sector. So as you can see here, she was formerly the chair professor of social anthropology at Cambridge University with a specialization on Africa. So she's an Africanist um, and also social anthropologist. And later she became the director of gender institute at LSE before moving on to the UCL to set up this institute. So this has a very intellectual background, has an impact on how we approach post-development in our institute. And uh, because uh, the anthropology tradition gives you emphasis on the bottom up, on the context, on the richness of the, the different localities around the world, rather than imposing a kind of one size fits or developmental uh, kind of model to different, to different countries. We turn it up and um, try to ask the people, what is a good life for you? What kind of life you want to live? And how can we collectively build a life that is fitable for the local context and for and that is also sensitive of the history culture religion or diverse uh, kind of and the richness embedded in that context so that is the sociology tradition the feminist tradition is that we yes we also teach feminism but we also want to practice feminism in our carry out of these projects and activities. And this is reflected throughout in our program and also in our institutional settings. So very often, we often hear students in the past few years that they really enjoy the atmosphere at IGP. Um, and I myself really enjoy working there. And I think we create a different environment for, for, for students and for staff to, um, in, in the higher education context. And another thing that I want to emphasize, as you can see here, she is Dame because she was awarded uh, Dame Command of British Empire, I think back in 2016 for her service in social sciences. But the more important aspect, I think is not that title, it's her connection to the policy making circle because as the Dame, she sits in the House of Lords and she's also all of our research is actually directly influencing a lot of the public policy making, not only in the UK, but also worldwide. Next slide, please. And as you can see here, we, we are currently offering three master's program. And the first is, and we often get students who ask, what are the differences between these three programs and how can I choose? So first one, global prosperity was the one that focused on society. So I come from, I was trained originally as an economist and then move on to political uh, science and the international studies. Um, so this is the master's program that for students coming from a traditional social, broader social science background. And the second is one focused on entrepreneurship, but this is not a business school program. We try to use entrepreneurship to solve public problems. The third one is a focus on ecology and also economic, economic, uh, ecological economics. And we're introducing a new master's program next year, focusing on ma rebuilding macroeconomics. So the, 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 Characteristic that runs all through these programs is that we try to rebalance our value towards society and the environment through transdisciplinary, community co-design, democratic whole systems approach. So this is like, I think, the main approach of the IGP. Next slide, please. In terms of geographic coverage, we currently work, have local projects running for many years. At least some of these projects have been running for at least 10 years in the UK, especially the Olympic uh, Park area and in East London, in Lebanon, which also now expands into the Middle East and also Africa. And I'm also co-leading the Asia Prosperity Hub where we will be launching a, 
a series of events specifically related to Asia. And the latest one is a project that I co-designed called Feminist Futures Across Asia, where we think, look at how feminist movements, political movements are reshaping the democratic, uh, demographic, movement, uh, democratic movements in Asia. Next slide, please. And also, I want to emphasize the Citizen Science Academy that we introduced to UCL last year, and IGP is leading it. And the quoting Professor Moore, uh, this is the most significant cha change in what university do since they admitted women. Because, you, you know, UCL is the first university in the UK that actually grant women the equal status in entering the higher education. But now, after, but now there are still many people who didn't, who not, didn't get the chance to receive a proper university education who are being blocked out outside of this knowledge sphere. And the citizen science approach is really to give these people who didn't have the opportunity to be educated in the higher education sector an opportunity to, to train them, to teach them with proper skills and ask them to use these methods to make policy change for their local communities. So this is actually bringing the a threshold between the higher education and the disadvantaged communities in society. So this is also a flagship methodology that we are trying to introduce, not only at UCL, but also in a lot of the projects that we are doing across the world. So, um, so much from me. Um, I think Pushpa, uh, you're the next. Unmute myself. Okay, cool. So, as I had already said at the very beginning, the MSc Urban Studies was launched in 2008 by the UCL Urban Laboratory. Um, the UCL Urban Laboratory is an interdisciplinary center bringing together researchers and teachers with all kinds of preoccupations around the urban, and it cuts across the global north and the global south. Um, it is also now part of a um, European-wide uh, and a global-wide network of urban labs uh, established uh, across different cities, um, um, ranging from Johannesburg to Antwerp. Um, and our purpose is that um, we need to think in terms of um, uh, innovative and imaginative Im engagements with cities and urban life. Um, so this was a survey done by our students um, and having very close connections with our alumni is a very key part of our um, MSc Urban Studies program. And almost all of them every year um, highlight the fact that it's quite diverse and it's very engaging and it's um, uh, interdisciplinary as well as resourceful. So our core modules range from very intellectually driven theoretical in, uh, pursuits of uh, key debates and discourses to practice based uh, engagements with urban challenges. How, how can we probe some of the urban issues that are at the heart of the way we live our life uh, in this planet um, through very practical kind of embodiment of um, um, these challenges. And so our core modules vary from uh, city space and power to uh, urban imaginations to um, urban um, uh, practices. Can we go to the uh, next slide, please? Um, so the other thing we quite uh, emphasize and is central to our pedagogic approach is um, uh, the fact that we use London as a living laboratory in the way we build our curriculum and the pedagogic experience. So um, most of our modules and teaching practices are built around uh, not only visiting uh, London as a field site, but also learning from London. And on top of that, ensuring that London can learn from elsewhere as well. So it's not just London as an exemplar of um, learning practice, urban practices, but also how can London learn? And in I, I didn't, emphasizing this um, uh, multicultural and diversified nature of looking at London is, for instance, we take students on walks to Elephant and Castle, which, um, uh, which is right here, which is the heart of um, the Latin American community in London, and to show that you, know, you cannot think about London um, through a very singular narrative of global city. Um, it's a uh, it's a diversified and divergent sense of the global that comes to uh, characterize a city like London. Um, and uh, we have also very London specific courses um, uh, offered as optional modules, such as London Aspects of Change, Creative Cities. Um, and as I said, one of the core modules, Urban Practices, is about practice based engagements with, um, uh, with, within different sites uh, in London. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, um, you know, the term one core modules, as I said, are city space and power and urban imaginations. 
We are also, we pride ourselves on offering very rigorous methodological uh, training uh, in case you want to um, uh, think of doing a PhD. So social science research methodologies is a, uh, is a module that has been developed within geography to cut across different MSc uh, human geography programs. In term two, the core module is urban practices, um, plus uh, other optional modules that range from creative cities within um, geography, public space in the city, to histories of global London, which is offered within uh, the Bartlett. I myself offer an optional module, cities and climate change. And so the idea is that um, you take your um, interests uh, across a range of um, uh, different pursuits from uh, society to environment to planning to um, uh, uh, to um, uh, to personal narratives. So, can we go to the next slide? Um, um, as I said, you know, um, we draw on our very rich alumni um, set of students to understand um, how the program ha has uh, served their own um, uh, purposes and what has come out of it and what roles our students have beyond the MSCs. And this is just a, a range of uh, different things that students have gone on to do um, uh, based on a survey that we did in 2015 with our alumni. Um, we regularly bring the alumni back to the classroom to share their experiences with their students, not just in terms of the dissertations, but also career, or, uh, uh, career choices and options. Um, so it can be anywhere from journalism and creative writing to research-based roles and think tanks to the government, um, as well as, um, um, you know, going on to maybe even doing a PhD. So about um, 10 to 15 percent of our MSc students stay on to do a PhD either at UCL or go to the U.S. or anywhere around the world. Um, and um, so the intellectual rigor that we bring to this program is quite key um, uh, as it lay, it's a very, um, very much a foundational MSc when it comes to thinking in terms of um, urban studies discourses uh, critically and debates around cities across the globe. I think that's it from me. Uh, UN, uh, yeah. Thank you. We can invite Alex. Yeah. Uh, thanks both. Um, yeah, so the Gender Society and Representation MA, a bit different because it is a, an MA rather than an MSc, is located at the UCL Centre for Multidisciplinary and Intercultural Inquiry. And so we are, multidisciplinarity is what we do and where we sit. So we welcome people from everywhere, all kinds of disciplinary backgrounds and geographic locations each year. Uh, between um, 30 and 50 students a year. Um, really, our aim is to provide the frameworks for understanding gender, sexuality and their intersection with multiple vectors of power in everyday life and in uh, social, cultural and political contexts. So we are located in the CMII, but we draw on uh, many different people across UCL uh, for our teaching, uh, across different faculties and departments. So we really do balance insights and approaches from across the social and historical sciences and the arts and humanities. So our students will have done sociology, uh, but also history. They'll be trained in archive research. They'll have done empirical projects before they come to us. They will be interested in literary theory because they've done a literature undergrad. Uh, they might be doing IR or politics or political theory. Uh, they might be influenced from their studies in geography. Uh, most years we have someone who's from a law background and we also have people from history of art. So it really is really, really diverse. Um, and also we find that lots of students come to us from kind of uh, different levels of experience in terms of professional careers before they choose to do a master's. And we really, uh, because gender and sexuality studies is a um, subject that's often motivated by personal experience, we do draw on a lot of different people's sense of uh, their personal experience um, in different, in where they come from. Next slide, please, Sonia. Studying gender with us is about uh, looking at gender as an object of research. Yes, of course, uh, gender as your topic, perhaps you are looking at gender in certain contexts. And I would qualify this by questioning whether, uh, you know, gender 
is equal to studying women in terms of add women and stir. Uh, it's not an approach we, it's an approach we seek to go beyond. And specifically that is by looking or thinking with gender as a lens, gendering certain contexts, gendering uh, our approach to um, diagnosing power relations in certain contexts, political contexts, bureaucratic contexts. And for that, we draw on a lot of different uh, modes of critical theory from gender and queer scholarship to critical race studies. Um, and we give you an introduction to that in the first term uh, and in our core teaching. And then there are specialist pockets around certain modules where you will extend your engagement with critical theory. Um, we take gender as inextricably linked to sexuality, uh, and we look at that in the first term as well, how we kind of understand the link between gender and sexuality, as well as questioning the link between uh, sex and gender as categories of analysis and experience. And we also encourage you, you know, the, the year is about a broadening. It is about exposing people to as many different things that they can do within this multidisciplinary field and encouraging people to pursue their own um, interests. So it is not an MA that is designed to test you on this broad array of things that we throw at you. It is about finding your path through this really busy, really engaging, really topical field and the accumulation, the sort of the point of all that is in your dissertation. That is still broadly informed by a social science approach. And within our MA, we have this unique emphasis on representation, and that can mean representation in politics and society. And we look, as I indicated from the sample uh, lecture, we look at questions of inequality and difference. And here we're looking at social structures and material resources, um, social movements, activisms, uh, questions of international development, take, trying to take a transnational perspective across different um, settings critiques of neoliberalism and rights, but also sort of good old fashioned questions of the gender division of labor and heteronormativity in state institutions such as religion and the family. Next slide, please. But then we also have an emphasis because we sit where we sit in, um, we're in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, we also draw on the questions around cultural representation. And for me, as someone who did their undergrad in English, English literature and their Masters at SOAS in anthropology and a PhD at LSE, where it was all social science, then this isn't sort of an anathema to do to look at cultural representations alongside social science approaches. So we look at how gender and sexuality gain meaning and value through these cultural practices and representations. And this really spans uh, kind of questions of religious traditions, ethnicity, national identity, and we might use ethnographic approaches, um, but it also spans literary analysis and uh, a more deconstructive approach to the meanings embedded in film and social media in particular. Next slide, please. So this just gives you some sense of our uh, modules really, the, the breadth of our curriculum, which th these are all modules that are in-house. Our core curriculum is these two uh, top courses here, gender theory, politics and feminism, which I teach in the first term. And then through two terms, you'll have multidisciplinary approaches to gender studies, which is a sort of smorgasbord of all the things you can do within gender studies, all the topics and approaches you can cover. And then our optional modules listed below really represent the specialisms of our staff, um, but also what we want to do, especially in these first two critical introduction to sexuality studies and decolonial approaches. This is where we want to further your engagement with some of the issues that we view as integral to debates in the field today, which we cover in the core courses. And we encourage students to take one of these two modules in the first term. And then we have a range of other specialisms that you can choose as you go forward into your uh, rest of your MA. But also we draw from, we uh, we have students taking modules in the Institute of Education, uh, in geography, in history, um, also other postgraduate taught programs at the CMII. For example, those attached to the race, ethnicity and post-colonial studies MA or the health humanities MA. 
final uh, slide, please. And that's really something here, are, this is us, McCaw staff. We all come from really different disciplinary backgrounds and we all have quite distinct research interests. So um, please feel free to contact any of us with questions about the MA or your own research in, interests and how that might follow through to your masters, already thinking of your dissertation, for example. And we're happy to point you in the direction or, or answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alex. I think we can now, we have like 30 minutes for any uh, Q&A or discussion. So we already have one question. I think that's directed for you, Alex. You're muted. Sorry, yeah, I'm coming. Yeah. yeah. This is a question about background in maths and work in financial services, uh, gender volunteering research, and how to pitch an application. Um, thanks for that. That is a, a great question. I mean, this isn't, uh, we would welcome that application. I think uh, we welcome strengths from different disciplines. Um, especially highlighting your interest in your personal statement, your interest in uh, gender, if that comes from volunteering and engagement with organizations. As I said before, gender and sexuality studies is particularly, um, people often engage in it from a very personal perspective, but that may also uh, carry things from your professional experience. Um, I had a, a student a few years ago who has since become a barrister uh, who uh, had worked in management consulting for about five years and who wrote her dissertation on questions of um, equality and the performativity of gender within management consulting firms, the management and regulation of sort of gender kind of behaviors. And she did an empirical study with interviews and uh, kind of brought different frameworks to analyze those interviews. And that drew on her professional experience uh, in a related field. And then she carried that forward beyond to her work. She works on prison reform as well now. So we really, in terms of academic background, there really aren't any constraints because once you get to the program, you also tailor your choices to lean towards your strengths. You know, if you want to take a module in film studies because you haven't done it before and you fancy a little bit of that, you can do that. But if you want to stick to approaches that you're more familiar with in social science, you can do that and you can go beyond the program as well for other uh, modules. So I wouldn't view it as a barrier at all. And we certainly have lots of people coming to us after they've had a break for professional experience and I think there's a lot of value in that and and you should emphasize the value derived from your professional experience in your application. Thanks. Um, do we have any other questions from students? You're welcome to use the Q&A function or just type in the chat box. I think we can, we're able to monitor both and as you do that I think um, okay for me um, it stopped at Amatya saying, what about posts and decades, especially the new liberal era? I think it's because of interest in global capitalism in that context. Um, yes, I, I don't think one necessarily post sense so you, you know that um, the human development, um, human development report has still being reported by the United Nations every year as the challenge to the GDP oriented kind of a system where I think Professor Sense Legacy is still very active in our world today, especially in the major development organizations. Uh, and also the Oxbridge Human Development Network is still very active. What, what we are trying to do is, I think we are a different approach. And you can see that both me, both the IGP and the SEN are post-development to a certain extent, as we try to challenge the kind of very traditional uh, poverty. Sometimes it's poverty focused. But the problem with poverty alleviation is that it's we, we think that it only address some of the superficial problems, for example, giving aid to these developing countries, where a lot of the African countries are saying that you're not actually helping us because you are, if you don't address the unequal world system that created inequality in the first place, 
then just by giving these countries constant aid doesn't really help them to have a sustainable to come out of that break away from that structure that embedded them into poverty in the first place. So we need more systematic approach. And the, and but the I think Professor Sen's approach is primarily focused on human, as the title suggests. So whether it's capability approach, right? When he's saying, oh, development has freedom, it has a clear human focus, or whether it's uh, human development, again, it's about cultivating the capabilities of human beings so that you can realize whatever potential that you want to achieve. I think that is a very um, important contribution from economic philosophy that he's bringing to the field. But what we are seeing, and we are actually having the IGP uh, Lebanon week this week, and we try to bring uh, people into discussing what is the green future, for example, for the Middle East and North Africa, right? So a lot of the pressing problems that we are facing, especially these poor communities, they usually become more vulnerable when climate changes or when the war happens. And our project in Lebanon specifically focused on mass displacement. So there is a large population that has been displaced out of their original home because of war. So these are kind of problems that cannot be solved by focusing on human beings alone. So that is why I think the IGP approach kind of differs from the same post appro approach in the sense that we still value the humans, human beings. We still think that cultivating human capability is important, but we need to go beyond the human focused approach to look at what is going on with the politics, what is going on with the nature, what is going on with the environment. And that is why I think our three master's programs have its own focus, but at the at, at the lay, deeper layer, it also deeper layer of it, they also run through all the common themes. So our students can actually choose selective courses from the three different modules. So we do interact a lot within the IGP. And as I think Alex and the Pushpa has explained at the UCR, I think it's a general practice that students can choose optional modules that they are interested in from other departments. So um, the department usually provide a knowledge base, but then you are also free to explore whatever you want to learn from other UCL departments. And that is why we are here today, coming from different departments, trying to talk to you to show you how we interact with each other. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. And um, 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 I think since Francesca is here, it might be helpful for her to introduce a little bit about scholarships. Francesca, if you are able, I know that it's a bit of, at this stage of time, it's a bit late, but I think there are still scholarships available at UCL, right? Yes, hi, I'm Francesca Harrison. I'm the program manager at the IGP. Um, there are still scholarships available. Let me just get the web page open um, and I can go through them. Um, if, if there are any other questions to be answered, maybe go to those first and then I can come back to you in one, one moment. Pushpa, may I ask you a question uh, regarding your program? And because we also run the urban, uh, we also called, have a module uh, delivered by Dr. Hannah Bowman called Urban Studies. I was wondering, apart from UC, and usually the kind of field visits are students' favorite component of the course. So apart from field visits in London, do you do any other uh, projects in different parts of the world? Um, I think you no, mentioned it briefly. Uh, the different parts of the world is mostly related to the dissertations where students engage with the um, cities or the places they are from, and we encourage them to go back and use them as a uh, more critical explore exploratory terrain for um, uh, for purposes of dissertation. Um, but um, I think we really value the way in which um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a dual thing that it's not only about learning from London, but how London can learn from elsewhere as well. So, um, that relates back to the research backgrounds of all the contributors to the program. So I work on Chennai in India. So it's all about how, you know, London can learn from Chennai or looking at London via Chennai. Um, Andrew Harris, who's the convener of the MSc uh, Urban Studies Program, has done comparative work between London and Mumbai. Fabian Kant, who's uh, another uh, contributor to the MSc program, um, works uh, largely in um, Ivory Coast, uh, Abidjan. And so it's about, uh, he looks at um, police 
police surveillance and security, urban security, and you know, compare draws very interesting parallels between um, surveillance societies uh, and urban security in London and uh, Abidjan. And uh, a lot of the convergences and divergences are super interesting to observe and uh, write about. So. Um, we don't do field works per se, overseas field work at, at the MSc Urban Studies level, but um, we encourage students to think about um, via dissertations how um, they can position their different um, geographical interests um, as a center point of their dissertation inquiries. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can get back to Francesca regarding the scholarships. Yeah, I can come back in. Uh, my colleague Dana has helpfully put a link into the chat where you can go to the UCL scholarships finder, where you can search for all of the scholarships that are available throughout UCL. Um, if you are interested in applying specifically to the IGP and the Bartlett, uh, then I can also just flag a few other ones that we have. We have the IGP equity fund, uh, and that deadline is the 31st of May. There's the Bartlett promise scholarship, which again, the deadline is the end of May. There is the Bartlett Promise Sub-Saharan Africa Master's Scholarship. Uh, that The deadline for that is the end of March, so very soon. And there's also the UCL Master's Bursary, and the deadline for that is the 8th of June. But as I said, for wider scholarships, the link to the uh, UCL Scholarships Finder is available in the chat. Yeah. Um, if, uh, Alex or Pushpa, do you have anything to add regarding scholarships? I think what... Um, Francesca introduced many of these scholarships should also be available for your programs. Yeah, especially the ones on the UCR level. So, um, yeah. So, um, I think we have two minutes left. I just want to give a piece of personal advice for students, and this is general advice because I've been the admissions tutor of my program and I've seen hundreds or thousands of applications since I joined UCL, just some practical advice for students. So first of all, if you come from a disadvantaged background or less represented background, do seek, uh, do make use of the funding opportunities available. Sometimes for some scholarships, uh, we don't receive enough high quality applications. So, so don't think that you are not competitive enough. You never know until you try. So this is just for, uh, especially important for students who are already represent, underrepresented. Uh, do give it a try to those to and apply to those scholarships.